<laughs> okay, I was just reading Helena's message to me. She says, woohoo, here we are again. <laughs> It is fun. I'm glad I started doing this. It's been fun. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Today is January 5th. This is our question and answer for Thursday night. We do this every Thursday night, which is super fun. And then it goes on to YouTube so that people can watch the recordings. And I'm averaging about like 23, 25 people watching the recordings. So that's good. Somebody's uh, Somebody's been enjoying these. I have some friends on the East Coast uh, who... Just different. I have family members there, and I have just other acquaintances, and I think a lot of those people get on because, for them, this is pretty late, especially when we go late. Uh, we've had some of these Q and A's go up to two hours. The last three or four months have only been keeping it to an hour because that's much more reasonable. Uh, let me let me change my screen just a little bit here. This is a picture of me in a greenhouse that I had in Oregon. We had an acre and a half under a greenhouse um, up there. We were in the Willamette Valley, and it was fun. It was it was pretty good. But anyway, there's just an old picture. I thought I'd bring it out and show everybody. <coughs> Excuse my cough. I'm still coughing a little bit. I talked for about 90 minutes today straight. I did a class for... Uh, uh, regenerative agriculture summit and we had some of the the experts about regenerative agriculture on there and it's been a three-day class today was the last day and i uh, taught a soil health um, part of that so my between my cold and all that talking we're going to keep this short today <laughs> but i certainly want to answer anybody's questions that you have but here are the eight ways that I help people to grow food. And I just go through this really quick um, every week so that people on YouTube can see this in case they don't, uh, in case this is the first time here. So I have a YouTube channel. I have my Zoom meeting every Thursday. That's what this is. I have my Patreon uh, site, and that is where I have over 500, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> over 500 videos and articles. And you pay $8 a month and you have access to that video library that shows you observation of what you need to be looking for when you're out there in your farms, your fields, your greenhouses, your gardens. And it shows you how to do things. And it, so I cover a lot of stuff. I do try to cover some psychology with that on how we need to be thinking and how we need to be planning and what we're doing. So that's a good one. Uh, and the people who've been on there, most of them, I've had good comments. I think people are basically happy with that. Uh, the next thing is my 17 week farmer career training course. A lot of people can learn uh, the, the whole idea of like entrepreneurship and business. You can find that in hundreds of places. It's harder to find hands-on production, um, agricultural production nowadays, especially um, involved in old-fashioned organic um, farming and gardening, uh, which is what we call regenerative. Regenerative is the buzzword nowadays. And the reason it's called regenerative agriculture is because back in the day, everybody was just called organic farmers or whatever, and that's kind of what we called ourselves. And then when the United States Department of Agriculture decided that organic had to mean something, if you're going to label something organic, there had to be a, a set standard behind it. And the people who call themselves or, um, regenerative now, they didn't really agree with that. We felt like it lowered our standards, which it did. And so we stopped calling ourselves organic. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so now, now regenerative is the buzzword. Number five, I'm a laboratory. I can do soil, <laughs> excuse me, do soil testing for you. Uh, I'm available to do consulting if you need help. And I have my boot camp, and my boot camp is coming up in a couple of weeks. So that's super exciting. We're having a winter boot camp to focus on growing food in the middle of the winter when there's lots of snow outside. And the last thing is my book. I've been working this winter to get my book done, and it's not done yet. I uh, There's a special spot in heaven for, for people who edit books. I'm learning that. 
So let's move on. Today we're going to talk about the soil. What is the soil telling you? And we're going to talk about uh, one test that you can do at home. And there's a lot of tests and a lot of tools we can use. And we can hire professionals to help us do soil testing. Tonight, we're going to talk about one test you can do at home. So how do we know what the soil is te telling us? This is a picture I took on a client's field. And we wanted... And we take a picture like this, basically in the same spot every year, and then we can compare each year how um, how the ground looks. Are we seeing more bare earth this year or last year? Are we seeing it like, let's say you had five years, so you have five, five pictures, uh, and you can start to see trends that are happening. And the trends will happen, meaning you'll grow more plants or less plants. That would be a trend. Uh, but they will happen because of our management. The, the, the decisions we make as human beings, managing the land, being stewards over the land, will either make plants grow more or grow less, or good plants versus less useful plants. So uh, taking pictures is vital. And that's actually one of the tools, but we're not going to really talk about that too much tonight, other than that's what this picture is. But if we look at this picture, let's kind of focus in there. I'm just going to grab my cursor here and, and move around this picture. So right here, it looks like some kind of a legume, probably a vetch right there. I know it's it's kind of small there, but and then there's quite a few different grasses. It's hard to tell the different species of grasses until they have a seed head on them. But there are three plant groups that look like grass. There are grasses, sedges, and um, oh, what's the other one? Oh, rushes. Um, grasses, sedges, and rushes. Grasses will have branches. So the grass will come up and then it'll branch off or a leaf will come off and then it'll go up again a little couple inches and then, then another leaf goes the other way. So grasses have branches. Sedges have edges. So they're triangular shaped. The, the little stalk, the leaf that comes up is triangular shaped, but it won't branch out. And then rushes are round um, like uh, like a pen or a pencil. Of course, most pencils nowadays are more like an octagon shape, but they're, they're uh, a cylinder. So rushes are cylinders. So that's how you can tell the difference in, in those three different plant groups. And then, of course, we have forbs. A forb is any plant that has a flower. So a flowering plant is a forb. And then we have legumes, and legumes do have flowers. So yes, legumes are forbs, but not all forms are legumes. Leg <coughs> legumes produce, uh, what do they produce? They, they will produce nitrogen in the soil. They team up with bacteria and create nitrogen, but they're creating it for themselves. And usually they don't release the nitrogen for other crops until that plant has died, or at least the root portion of the plant where that um, symbiotic relationship of the plant and the bacteria is making the nitrogen. So, and and there could be some debate on exactly how I, I explained that, but basically that's uh, that's true with most of them. Some of them could be giving off nitrogen um, while, during their growth, but a lot of them don't. So, so there's just a little bit of what we're seeing in here. So I think it looks like there could be some yarrow in here. Most of it is, is I think that vetch and vetch is a legume. And so we're seeing grasses and vetches in this picture. What you want to see in a picture like this is five or six different um, plant species. And I'm seeing basically two in here. Uh, so there are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there are two different trains of thought when it comes to testing soils. One is we test for nutrients. The other one is we test for microbial life. And the testing that has been going on for the last 50 years, 60, 70 years, has been for plant available nutrients in the soil. And it's only been in recent years that we've started doing tests that test for the microbes that will create the nutrients for the plants. So the kind of testing I do is the microbial life testing. So here we go. 
<laughs> we have uh, the shovel test tonight. That's what we're going to talk about. So this is our major subject tonight. So when you go out in your field, this could be in a garden. This could be in a flower pot. This could be on rangeland with sagebrush and um, giant um, grasses. This could be anywhere that you want to look at the soil. You can do this anywhere. But the main thing that a shovel test will tell you is the health of the spheres of the soil. So in the last two weeks, I don't know if it was two weeks ago or last week, but we talked about the the six spheres of the soil. And we've been saying the five spheres for years, but within the last, uh, re very recently, I think it was early, like last year, so it's almost a year ago, I think, Ray Archuleta added in, and re by the way, Ray Archuleta is one of our top soil scientists in the country, but he added in a, a sixth um soil sphere which is the phylosphere which is means the the leaves that are collecting the sunlight and creating photosynthesis but when we dig the dirt up we don't see the phylosphere so what we're going to be looking at is the other five spheres and so if we go down to number six seven eight nine and ten um well ten's not part of it but but roots, the aggregates, the pores, the detritus, these are um, the spheres that we're looking at. Uh, we're also can want to look for the, uh, the drillosphere, and that's number three, which is the earthworm count. So we can actually count the earthworms, but before we start counting earthworms, we want to look and see if there's earthworm holes, and that would actually be the drillosphere or the holes themselves inside the soil. So if we look at this picture here, you can see where my two fingers are here. This is the A horizon and it's pretty thick. It's two and a half to three inches thick here, depending on where you go around here, because it was different depths at different places as we rolled this um, root ball around. But um, so this is, uh, this is that top part. It, this has most of the roots right here in the top couple of inches. And it was so thick with fine roots we call those uh, the fibrous roots, but it was so thick with those that this was almost like a potting soil or like a peat moss. And most of those roots are alive and they're the grass that you see growing in this pasture. And then, so I'm gonna point with my pointer. So look right here, see this white section here? It looks kind of chalky. This was a, a hard pan. So when I stuck my soil penetrometer in here, I didn't mean to change the slide, sorry. When I stuck the soil penetrometer in here, so it, so this is the top of the soil. So it would have went in this way. This is going down into the soil the way this is, is sitting. So it came down about two and a half to three inches and it was hitting that hard pan. And then we were hitting uh, 150 plus pounds per inch, which is uh, an impenetrable hard pan for most roots, for most species, uh, Purdue teaches us that no roots can go through 300 PSI, but most roots won't go through 150. And as I took this root ball apart and looked at it, below this, um, this hard pan, there were maybe like less than one-tenth of the roots in this mass down here than what there was up here. So this definitely was keeping a lot of the roots out. Now, two and a half inches is not enough soil depth before it's hitting basically concrete to have healthy plants. These grasses in this field, there are cool season grasses here. There's also some warm season grasses. And you want to have a mix of cool season and warm season grasses. But your warm season grasses are the species that are going to be collecting most of the carbon from the atmosphere and putting that into the soil. And it turns the soil a very dark, dark color. Look Now, if you look over here, see how this is a darker color? This is more like a 70% chocolate bar, maybe not quite that dark, but it's a very dark color. And over here, this is a lot lighter, obviously, here and then up here. So there is more carbon in this darker soil than there is up here. But we should have these soils be like, uh, you know, dark like that, 10 feet deep. And these, 
these roots should be going 10 feet, not two and a half inches. So this is a problem in this field right here. And so when you take your shovel out, hopefully this discussion we're having tonight, maybe it's more of a lecture because it's kind of the way I am, sorry, but uh, this, uh, hopefully this is helping you to kind of see what you're looking for when you dig up a clump of soil. So when we dig this up, we want to look at it. We want to look at the, the different spheres. So let's um, think about that. You've got your aggregates, which forms your grotto sphere. So good soil should have a cottage cheese type texture. It should be, you should have great big lumps in there. And you can kind of see that right in here. And, and you can see it a little bit right in here. This is so filled with roots in here, so compacted with roots. There's not a lot of spaces, but as we pull it apart, if you look at the bottom, there are aggregates here. So is this sample well aggregated or not? Yes, actually it is. It does have the cottage cheese type flavor. Uh, I said flavor, I didn't taste this. Texture is the word I tried to say. And this, you can see those big lumps like right here, right where I'm pointing with my cursor here. So, I mean, that, there's a great big aggregate right there and there's a huge one right above it. So those are macro aggregates. And there's also a thing called a micro aggregate, but you can only see them under a microscope. So, uh, but this is well aggregated, aggregated, which is a good thing. So when you have good aggregation, that automatically makes uh, the porosphere, which are the pores between the aggregates. So the pores between the aggregates is where water is going to come rushing down in when it gets irrigation water or rainfall or when snow melts. And we want that porous sphere, all of those holes are of the pores, that's where the water goes, right past all those aggregates. If you don't have good aggregation, then your soil can't infiltrate water. And so, so will this soil infiltrate water? Yes, except for this hard pan. So down here, we have better aggregation than up here. It's not that this isn't well aggregated. It's just that it is so thick with roots that it's filling up the porosphere. These roots are trying to go 10 feet deep and they can't. And so, no, this soil probably isn't um, infiltrating the way that it needs to. Um, yeah, uh, let's move on. Let's look over here at our list. Um, we've covered compaction pretty good. Earthworms, color and carbon. You really want to focus on the color. I know we talked about color already, but think about the color. If you have the opportunity to have a machine like a backhoe, and you could dig down, you know, a long way, dig down six feet, see what's happening. You will see dark soil down to a certain point, and suddenly it will turn. Just like this hard pan right here turns, it goes from this this light brown to a white color, you will see that when your topsoil ends. But see, our topsoil hasn't ended here. We just have different layers, but it hasn't ended here. So if we brought a backhoe out or any other kind of machine that you could dig down in with, the backhoe is just easy. Uh, maybe a foot down or two feet or 10 feet down, you would hit the subsoil and you're gonna have a, a straight line like you're seeing right here. And it'll go from the dark topsoil color and it's gonna change to a light color, a much lighter color. The interesting thing is when you do that, if you spend quite a bit of time and you're really looking at the soil and you're using the tool of observation really well, you will find the earthworm holes, which again is our, uh, our drillosphere, you will find those going below the topsoil down into the subsoils. Uh, and there's different species of worms and the worms will 
the worm, different species will do different things. Some stay in the top six inches of soil. Other ones burrow deep, deep, deep um, feet, you know, 10, 20 feet deep. And so having the different species is a good thing because you want that drillosphere to go way down in. The other thing that's interesting, sometimes we will take a soil sample that is 10, um, 15 feet. And, and let's say, you know, sometimes this line where the color changes, maybe two feet deep of the dark soil, but we keep digging down 10 feet or something. And in those deeper soils, we still can find the soil microbes that help soils function. So just because the soil is a different color doesn't mean it's not helping you. So don't be afraid of light colored soils. And let me explain one thing that happens. <clears throat> this probably goes in a different class, but I'll just tell you since we're talking about microbes that are that deep, the fungus will attach itself to the root of a plant. It'll either go inside the root or on the outside of the root. And then it, it's hyphae. Of course, it's microscopic, so you can't see it but it's long. So um, I've used this analogy before, but I'm going to do it again right now. Think of a redwood tree. They're super huge around and, and then, but they're still really tall. Now think of a telephone pole. It's, it's still round, but it's still really tall. Now think of a fishing twine that is hanging down off of a 10 story building. Well, it's still super long, but it's very thin and you can't see it unless you're like two feet away from it or whatever. Now think of a structure like a fungal hyphae that is still as long as a 10 foot tall building, but it is like 50 or 100 times smaller around in diameter than the fishing twine. And this is how it can still be very long yet microscopic. So we can find those fungal hyphae deep into the subsoil um, not always, but sometimes we can find them. And what happens is they they are down there mineralizing, and so they are they have powerful enzymes, and they will melt the sand, silts, and clays, and they will get the minerals that the plants need. And when the plant needs a certain mineral, it tells the fungus that, and then the fungus will mine that far away. could be hundred yards or or a mile. It could be a long, long ways away, and it will bring that nutrient through the fungal hyphae to the plant root. So that is incredible. And these are new things that we're just learning in science in the last 20 years, um, which is pretty remarkable. <laughs> so number five talks about smell. If you smell this soil sample, you can know if it's aerobic or anaerobic. Um, and let me just remind you, aerobic means oxygen, anaerobic means a lack of oxygen. So the if, if you're smelling down deep in the ground and it has a bad odor, like something is rotting or molding or a, a sewer smell, a, a cesspool smell, a manure smell, uh, uh, like a rotten egg smell, an ammonia smell. Those are all smells that are anaerobic. And anaerobic smells will tell you that you probably have disease-causing organisms in the soil. I mean, they don't have to be there, but that's the perfect conditions for them to grow. So if you if you smell that, you need to be working on <coughs> on building your soil so that it will be oxygenated. Uh, and, and it's easy to tell, you just, you smell it. A, a good soil should not have any smell or it smells really good and pleasing like a forest floor, okay? But anything offensive, it's usually a bad thing. Um, let's, let's, uh, I think we should, you guys, I, let me look up my chat. I can see there's people who have written something. So thank you <laughs> for writing. So my wife wrote, I don't know, I was taking those pictures. You probably did sniff and taste that soil. Okay, you need to remember when you took these pictures, Bernie, because you do have a picture of me smelling it, and that one is actually in my book. <laughs> so yeah, okay, Major said, 
So would this be possibly from fairly decent soil being tilled up and then compacting poorer soil on top? Um, yeah, I, I, I assume you're talking about that soil, that um, compaction line. Yeah, something happened in the history. If that's not what you're talking about, go ahead and clarify, and you can even unmute yourself and we can just talk about it. But uh, yeah, there was an event in this field at some point. This field's never been tilled in the history of the world. Uh, it's a, a, been a cattle pasture since the beginning of time, but there was some kind of an event <laughs> And it could have been a series of years. It could have been a, de been a decade. But some type of management created this. And usually when you start seeing white uh, build up in a certain layer, it's usually agricultural amendments, things like lime or gypsum, although they don't put lime and gypsum on the, on the ground around here, because if they did, it would make it worse. Um, that's something they do in the eastern United States or maybe like the Willamette Valley of uh, Oregon. Um, but a lot of times when you see the white like this, it's some type of an agricultural amendment that you're seeing. <coughs> so <clears throat> major equals David Fiddler. Hello, David. Glad you're on. I do know you. <coughs> okay, so this is, uh, yeah, I mean, this is the shovel test. And it's as simple as digging up your ground, looking at it. Seeing how many bugs are there, take note of that. If you don't have bugs in your ecosystem, something's wrong. Your ecosystem is broken. You should have like you should have so many bugs you don't even know what they all are. You should you know when you go start moving the detritus sphere back, which is the dead rotting plant material on the surface, you should be seeing ten or fifteen different kinds of bugs. You should see um beetles and wood lice and um you know just creepy crawlies of all kinds. And when you see a lot of insects and all the different arthropods, it's telling you that you have good diversity <coughs> and, and your soil health is probably a lot better than if you don't have bugs. So bugs are our friends. We want lots of bugs. Even when you see species of bugs that are, are a bad, species like uh, like a pest it, um, species that you know you're going to eat a specific plant um they still have a role in ecology and it's just uh, and if they're eating your plants then something is out of balance in your ecosystem um, to make the you know it's just, it's just causing a problem so but you can fix the the problems by getting things back into balance. And that's what we don't do in modern agriculture very often is we don't balance things. Um, we just start killing stuff. And then that throws it more out of balance. Let's see if I have another slide. I have my question slide. Boot camp's coming up January 19, 2021. I still have spaces for a few people. Come to that class. It's uh, $800 for a couple, $500 for an individual. Come to this class and you can learn everything I know in the course of three days. And we are going to work in the greenhouse together. I've got little transplants growing right now so that people can practice planting. We're going to plant seeds. We're going to mix potting soil. We are going to do um, all kinds of um, fun stuff. And so that's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Uh, so yeah, come to boot camp. Okay, questions. What are your questions tonight? You can type them in or unmute and let's just talk. Um, I have a quick question. So reclaiming land that has previously been building. So we're talking about an area that had a concrete slab on it for a while. The concrete has been intentionally broken up and drug away. But the, I mean, the ground under it's like one step above sand. Um, is it worth, like, would it be a good idea to, like, dig that out and fill it up with something else to try and turn into soil? I wouldn't go to that much work. Okay, here's the rule of thumb. This is what you always want to do. Take your very best land that you have and you improve that land first. 
so as soon as you get your best land at maximum production, that's when it becomes financially viable to take your poor land and get it good. There's been a lot of people who have spent a lot of money, like all their money, on the really poor land to make it better. And they did make it better, but it still wasn't producing enough to be profitable. And then they're broke. But if you take land that's producing pretty good, but it has room to improve, you put your, your time, your effort, your money into that land, then that will go from pretty good to excellent. And now it's making you a profit in your operation. So my question is, do you not have enough land that you have to use this really bad piece of land you have? Well, it's just a piece of land that's available. So we were we were just curious about what our best practice would be with it. Yeah, and of course, uh, I think I know what you're talking about because you just have a small, it's just a small garden plot. We're not talking about acres, right? Yeah, no. Yeah, so yeah, just, I mean, when did the cardboard or the, the concrete leave? Was it recently or was it years ago? It's uh, probably been three three-ish years okay so in the last three years have you had weeds growing there naturally uh the first year no the second year we had some scrub grass pull up this uh this last year there's been uh it's, it's pretty patchy but yes there's some there's still wide slats where nothing grows at all all right yeah so what you would i wouldn't dig that dirt out and take it away um, unless you think it has been contaminated with something like a nuclear warhead, which is unlikely, depending on where you live. Uh, if you had, if cars were there and there was a lot of oil in that ground, there could be some contaminants. Usually the ground is not contaminated, though. If you have weeds growing there, then it's not contaminated. So you could do a test this year. You could just water it and see what comes up naturally. Because there's probably weed seeds there. If, it, if the concrete's been gone for three years, I'm sure there's weeds there. Just weed seeds that have blown in. <laughs> so one thing you, you know, go ahead. One thing I'd considered is just getting a whole bunch of straw and wood chips and just piling it on four feet thick across the whole thing and just letting it rot down keeping it kind of moist yeah that's the right that's that's the perfectly, yeah do that that's the perfectly right answer and after you water it for you know a month or two if it heats up and starts getting composty and and hot that's a good thing but once it cools down below 80 degrees then fill it with earthworms and let them go to town and just start planting in it inoculate it with a bunch of fungus and, and beneficial fungus and bacteria and nematodes, microarthropods, all the other critters will come in naturally. And that's a good way to do it. And then just plant a bunch of plants in there. It'll be great. It'll heal itself. So what you're saying is the right thing to do. Unless you have some weird thing like a nuclear bomb blowing something up and, and you think it's contaminated. I mean, some people do deal with contaminated uh, land. And, and that's what we call bioremediation is when you take uh, biology that will collect contaminants. Usually it's different species of fungus that will do that. And they, they don't really, um, they don't remove the contaminant, but they tie it up in their hyphae. And so the, then they don't let the plants have it, which is awesome. So yeah, if, if our good friend Putin pushes the red button, now you know how to keep yourself from being poisoned with yeah, you encourage lots of fungus. It'll keep you safe and healthy. I, I have a question here. Uh, I think it's kind of related to it. And <clears throat> you mentioned inoculating the soil with the microbes and stuff, doing, and I assume that's using your mixture that with the, oh, the compost material and creating that kind of a tea or whatever. And yeah, use the extract. We call it an extract. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 
going over, I've got some areas that are, they've got weeds growing very sparse. I mean, you, it, you can see the brown looking sideways at it. You don't have to look straight down at it pretty much, but it has grown some weeds. So if just spraying the oh, extract over it, over time that will naturally work into it and create it a better soil or do I need to also be working to add in some other administrative so some compost or other materials that way? Okay, I'll give you the quick answer and then I'm gonna explain it. <laughs> the quick answer is yes, inoculate it. And then yes, you have to put other stuff on there to feed them. So here's the long answer. <clears throat> when you inoculate it, that is introducing the beneficial microbes. And you've got to realize that these microbes are your most important livestock you will ever have. So if you were going to have a cattle ranch and you bought a thousand acres of pure sand, and then you went out there and you looked around in two months and you go and you say, man, where's my cows? Well, you don't have any because you never bought cows and put them on there. All you have is sand. And so that so this is a really absurd analogy, OK? The second part is, let's say you do buy a bunch of cows. So you get 500 cows, you put them out there and you go back and you check them in another two months and they're all dead. Why? Because it was all sand and you didn't feed them. So if you're going to put a bunch 500 cows on a thousand acres of sand, you need to put hundreds of bales of hay out there also. You've got to feed them. So now let's switch cows into the beneficial microbes. So you have a piece of land you're trying to make healthy to grow a great garden. Well, you need to put the microbes out there. At the same time, they need food and water just like any other livestock. So there are two food sources for, for the uh, microbes, and that is your detritus sphere, which is the dead organic matter on top of the soil. So dead plant material, anything that you could compost. So wood chips would feed fungus. Green plants like grass clippings, that's going to feed bacteria. Um, so anything that you compost, any rotting organic matter will feed microbes. So the ground needs to be covered. And I say four inches is a minimum, 12 inches is better, but four feet is excessive. So Ezekiel, be careful about your four foot idea. Um, and the reason it's excessive is because oxygen only penetrates in one foot. And so you don't want it going anaerobic because then you're growing the wrong, uh, you know, the wrong species of organisms during this conversion process so so yeah food water microbes you will build a, a functioning soil so you would add like one inch maybe that's what i do in my gardens i add one inch of compost on top of my garden beds once a year not every time i plant because in my greenhouse i'm growing three to four crops a year in a bed but i'm only adding one inch of compost once a year <laughs> okay. The other question I've got is you've got your oh, worm bin inside the greenhouse where it's reasonably warm, doesn't get excessively cold. I don't currently have a facility that way that I can do that. So building something like that that would potentially be exposed to the open elements, is that going to be a problem for the worms or do I need a create some kind of protection for them. Yeah, uh, the worms will die if they freeze to death. So if your compost freezes solid, your worms are dead. So yes, that's a problem. And that is why I have it in my greenhouse is just to keep it warm. Cause we get cold here, you know, our, I mean, we were down almost to 20 below zero a couple of weeks ago. So, um, you know, so it can get cold here. So I need to build a kind of a shed or something that'll- Yeah, a root cellar. Um, could be easy, you know. Um, I mean, depending on your where you live. I mean, if you're in the middle of town, it's not going to work. But you know, you got no. a piece of land, so maybe you could build a root cellar that could um, do that type of thing for you. They could so, be built, 
kind of you know reasonably easy i mean labor but but not hundreds of millions of dollars so get a couple of boys out with shovels digging huh? yeah, yeah yeah put some people to work <coughs> okay more questions um in that last question um are we talking about worms in or worms in the ground? So worms in the ground just just go deeper freezes. Okay, Melanie, can you repeat that? I I only caught half of what you said. Okay, in the last question, you were talking about worm bins, I guess, or yeah. were you talking about worms in the ground? Because worms in the ground will just go deeper, won't they? Yes, that's absolutely true. We're talking about a composting system where we are growing the proper microbes so we can make an inoculant. And the way you do that is by building the compost in, in such a way that the worms are doing most of the work. So I don't, I mean, you, if you get on my Patreon uh, videos, you can go and look at the different videos of the worm band that's what we're talking about okay. is the yeah. worm band that's in my greenhouse you've seen that on those yeah. videos i have another question um i've been seeing a lot of ads for kitchen composters that turn scraps into garden soil have you seen anything about them yeah everybody's trying to sell a gimmick i'm not saying they don't work i'm just saying they are so small they are going to produce you such a small amount of material that you will be disappointed with the finished product. I did Especially see for the size of your garden. You've got that yeah. big area, you know, that you've been working on. You're going to need 20 of those units and 20 families to feed it, and you still won't have enough. Well, that's our problem anyway. <laughs> yeah. With I'll admit, I picked up one of those a number of years ago and it was worthless it didn't compost well i mean we had it was like a big barrel one you're supposed to crank around and work oh, it. That was a it, it really didn't work very well it was a waste of money these and, are automatic they're um they're like a machine it actually grinds the food up and turns it into soil in a matter of hours yeah <laughs> i don't i don't believe it yeah anyway it's, i sent some, I somebody sent people are trying to sell stuff you know everybody's trying to make a living and half of them are dishonest or they don't even know what they're trying to create maybe well, they think they're great product. Right? maybe they're not dishonest but it's not going to do what i'm talking about when i say compost yeah with the micro well i don't know i, I sent you a link so i'm really curious to get your um your view on it after you take a look at it i'm i'm kind of doubting it too but just wanted your opinion. All right. So it's in I, your I am up. opinionated. I can certainly give yeah. you an opinion. <laughs> okay. Ron, do you have questions tonight? I think Holly has a couple questions. Is that right? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I think that we need to get to our... Um, our property and put a shovel in the soil to see what we have going on. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Because we're not there just yet. So we're making our list of what we need to do when we get there so that we can do a few of these tests and kind of figure out where we're starting from. And then of course we'll we'll drag along as much cardboard as we can to start laying it out when we arrive. Um but I really want to put a shovel in the ground and see what we have going on. So perfect. Yeah, that's the right thing to do. Yeah, we still need to figure out our detritus source um because yeah. right now we our property is just covered with goat heads basically tumbleweeds as far as i know that's all i've seen on the property so far so we're gonna have to figure out what we can put on top of the cardboard to get yeah, it okay yeah so uh tumbleweeds and goat heads is that what you said goat heads Okay, so tumbleweeds and goat heads are early succession plants. That means that your soil is highly bacterial right now. Okay. And it's not a bad thing, but we do, it, but it's good to know that. And so okay. what you need to do, well, first of all, what kind of crops are you growing? Tell me that. Well, we want to we want to do a big garden to start with. So, so lots, lots of garden, garden vegetables. Yeah. Garden vegetables. Okay. Yeah. Are, are um, you a fan of cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, kale? 
Well, I am not so much Ron. <laughs> well, the broccoli's okay. <laughs> okay, so those are your cold crops or brassicas, mm -hmm. uh, and they're in the same family. And those are early succession plants, so you won't have to change your soil very much to have success growing those. Okay. I mean, you'll have to do some work with it, but not a lot. You now, if you want to grow tomatoes, <laughs> they're more of a late succession plant. Uh, meaning that they grow with a uh, back, I mean, a uh, uh, fungal uh, dominant soil. Okay. So you need a different type of soil. Okay. And so how are you going to get a fungal soil? Because I'm assuming you want tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. Yes. And oh, yes. yes. Okay. So, so how are you going to do that? Do you know? We talked about it in the last two weeks. That, so now's the test. <laughs> I shouldn't do that to people. I'm well, sorry. You, you said that wood chips um, encourage fungal growth. That's the answer. See, you do have it. I you wrote it wood down chips. right here. Wood chips feed the fungus. Okay. And so if you put the food out there on your thousand acres of sand, mm -hmm. then the fungus will come to the food source, just like the cows will go to the hay. Okay. We'll find wood chips. Yeah, you need wood chips. Talk to power line companies because they've got mm. those big trucks that the linemen go out and cut all the wood. And the, I mean, they probably don't have the wood chips, but for future reference, a lot of times those guys have a hard time knowing where to dump it. And if right. they can dump them on your land for free, they're happy to do it when they're in the area. Otherwise, it costs the company money to take them to the landfill. Mm. Right. So... Okay. I mean, I've I've had people dump them at my place for free, just the yeah. power company. Yeah, I had that done at a property I lived at before too. Yeah, perfect. So, so, so that's a that's a free source for wood chips. Okay. You just have to fight with the other neighbors who want them too. So right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it is a fight too. I tried to get some the other day, and there was like six people competing with me. Wow. I won, but still. <laughs> he won. Are you competitive? He, his last name's Demille. He probably has an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who else is on here tonight that hasn't asked a question? I have a question. This is Tatiana Fallon. Um, you probably know my mom, Anelody Milne. I don't know if you. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm glad you're on tonight. Thanks. Um, I'm here in Kentucky, so it's kind of it's dark, so you're not turning on my camera, but um, I, I used to farm and I had a garden in Utah and I did really well with it. But then I came here to Kentucky and I don't know how to manage the amount of water that I'm getting. And so I did the, we put down the cardboard and the, all the layers and I tried that and I think it just all washed away. Okay. So then last year I decided to do horticulture, but I needed to put it at my mom's house and so she wanted it to be pretty so I had to put it in garden boxes but now I think I have too much so I put like a layer of all the dead wood and then a, a layer of soil but I I have a ton of fungus do I have too much because am I not draining it well enough I just don't know how to like like plant when you have so much water <laughs> it's never been a problem before <laughs> Okay, here's the deal. You came to the right place. I used to live in Missouri. And so I know all about gardening on the east side of the Missouri River, which is the whole Eastern United States. There's a little bit differences, but there's not huge differences like from in the west to the east. <coughs> so, oh man, I want to talk about this for an hour. It's so exciting. I, what am I going to say to answer your question? I got to focus. Every gardening book that's ever been published, I shouldn't say that, 99.9% .9 of all gardening books that have ever been published were published in the eastern United States in places like Chicago and New York because that's where all of the old traditional publishing houses were. But guess what? They would sell the books in all 50 states and Canada and everywhere else but it was only applicable to east of the Missouri River. I mean, this should <laughs> blow our minds. Why are we 
Why are we gardening according to gardening books when they are inaccurate for the where we live? The whole reason I said that is because you in Kentucky can pick up almost any gardening book that was published in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, and it will tell you what to do. And they will say, make raised beds and garden that way, and it will work for you. That's how you deal with the water is with raised beds. I'm not necessarily talking about the garden boxes, although that it could be the definition of a raised bed. But your hugaculture thing is certainly a raised bed where you've got the wood on the bottom and then you're putting the potting soil or, or whatever your detritus on top. Just make it taller. And then you have to have walkways in between each bed so that the so that the water has somewhere to go. So your walkway is the ditch where the water goes away, so it drains away. But the roots of your plants are growing up on top of your raised bed, and so they can go down into the soil, and they're not getting waterlogged. And the, the, because when it gets waterlogged, the soil goes anaerobic, the, um, things get compacted, the bad um, anaerobic uh, organisms start growing, your plants die from rots and molds and diseases and blah, 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 which we don't deal with a lot in the West because we're dry here. Our struggle is not to get enough water on plants. So in the Western United States, we need to be building depression beds, like the walkway is the tall part and our plants need to be down in the hole. That's how the Hopis grow their um, crops. You know, they were farmers before white men ever showed up here, and they would dig holes down in the ground, and that's where they'd plant their seeds with uh, minimal or no irrigation um, down there in Arizona. And, and they were able to grow crops that way. And it's because the this, uh, this, this moisture would be going down. And so moisture always goes down. So if you're in a wet area, bring your plants upward. And if you're in a dry area, put your plants downward. But almost every garden I ever see in the West, they have raised beds because that's what the gardening book said. But the gardening books were written for east of the Missouri River. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tatiana, thank you for letting me rant and rave for a minute, but I need to clarify. Have I answered your question? No, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I just had to like switch my mindset about how I was growing things like in the arid climates and it may, explains a lot, yeah. Okay, so you, yeah, so you did ask one more question. You said, do you have too much fungus at this point? If you have disease causing fungus, yes, you have too much because any disease causing fungus is bad. And with a lot of water, you could have that. But if you are seeing fungus in the form of mushrooms, is that what you're seeing is mushrooms coming up? And yeah, breaking? like tons okay. of mushrooms. Yeah, that's tons. not a problem. Uh, I, th I think, I don't know this. We need to verify this. Somebody needs to help me do the research. But I think any, any fungus that produces a, a mushroom, th those are good guys. Those are mineralizers. Those are decomposers. Now, Sometimes a decomposer will decompose your plant roots, but that's because your plant roots were already dying because it was waterlogged, it was um, unhealthy. There could be a lot of other reasons, but your plant's already starting to die, and that's why it was getting decomposed. It wasn't uh, like a vicious um, disease like a, a Phytophthora or a Pythium. It, it, those, you know, those are common diseases that are fungal, but, but they don't turn into mushrooms. <laughs> I'm 99.999% yeah. sure about that one, but so I could have made a mistake there, but I think that's totally true. J my, just, to yeah. my tomatoes did really, really well, but my zucchinis died like instantly. So I don't know if like I didn't transfer them right or if I ha they just couldn't handle the amount of water. We had a very, very wet May when I planted. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, were your zucchinis in a pot and you were transplanting them? Uh, yes, and That's my two-year-old son, two son helped me, which was probably not helpful. He might have killed them too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he's the most important crop you'll ever have, so it's okay. Um, here's the other thing. All of your curcubits, that's what a zucchini is. So uh, like a, a squash, a melon, 
uh, pumpkins, those are cucumbers. Cucumbers don't if like you're you said Kentucky, right? Yeah, we're just like right along the Ohio in Kentucky, like northern okay, yeah, Kentucky. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so don't you have a long enough growing season there? There is no reason to ever plant a transplant of a curcubit. Just direct seed them; they will do much better. But you need to grow them on top of a raised bed because if you your if your ground is level, then you there's nowhere for that water to drain away. So you've got to have raised beds. Well, you don't have to, but to have super healthy plants, the raised beds are going to help you immensely. Thank you. That's super helpful. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, who is on here that has not asked a question? <clears throat> I think John Fisher wanted to ask one, and I was... I did actually have a couple of questions. But, I saw it uh, in your face. Go ahead. In my face. Okay, so uh, uh, Melanie wanted to know how you can tell if, uh, if it's what's diseased or something. Yeah, on this. If the fungus is diseased, how if the fungus is diseased, okay, re ask that question. Tell me more information. I don't know what you want to know. What you just said to this lady, oh. Tatiana. How do you well, know if the fungus in your soil is good or bad? Yeah, yeah. Okay. you don't. You send me a soil sample and I analyze it with my microscope, okay. and then I tell you. That's the okay. only way I know. I, I mean, there there are other indicators, but okay, okay, let me back up. If you're trying to diagnose a specific fungus that you pick up and you're looking at a fungus particle, you got to send me a soil sample where it was growing, okay? But let's go back to the shovel test. You guys all saw that picture, right? Yeah. Tonight. Think about that picture for a second. When you when you get that big old lump of soil and you're smelling it, if it stinks, then you have disease. If it smells really good, you probably don't have disease because all of your disease causers, 100% of the disease causing organisms that we know of so far, I don't even know what I said, 100% of the disease causers live in low oxygen conditions. So if it smells fresh and clean, like you would put that lump of dirt on your kitchen table as a centerpiece, I should do that. Is my wife listening? If, 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 you, if you put it, if you would bring it in your home and enjoy it as something beautiful, like a flower, because it smells so good, then it's not going to have disease problems because it's highly oxygenated. So that so so two different things, you know. How do you diagnose a specific fungus? A laboratory has to do that. How do you know if your conditions are going to grow healthy plants and be disease free? Dig with your shovel and smell the soil. If there's no okay. smell, that's the best. Okay, so how do you oxygenate oxygen? Oxygenate your soil. Uh, you put Worm. fungus food and bacterial yeah. food on top of the soil. Okay. And you water it and you grow plants in it. Now you have a food source for fungus, for bacteria, and you have a water source for them. And, you're, and you put fresh plants in it to grow. And as the plants are growing, the rhizosphere, which are the roots, will exudate the uh, the sugars, the photosynthesis, you know, the photosynth that goes into the roots, out into the soil, and those are your uh, food sources. Green living plants that are that are dying on the soil surface feeds the bacteria. Dead woody things like wood chips feed the fungus. Root exudates feed both fungus and bacteria. And once you have the bacteria and fungus in place, your other predators will come in and then uh, the protozoa will eat the bacteria. The microarthropods and the beneficial nematodes will eat the, uh, the fungus and bacteria. And then they will be giving off a balance of nitrate and ammonia. Am I saying that right? Ammonium or ammonium? Not ammonia, ammonia is bad. 
ammonium. So those are your two good forms of nitrogen that will grow the plants. You have fixed your soil. You'll never buy fertilizer again. But that can be a process of three to five years. Um, all right. Well, well, we're starting on that. Hey, that was so, way too complicated. You didn't want me to yeah. go into all that. <laughs> so um, uh, we got our topsoil. Uh, do we put cardboard on our top, top of our topsoil? Top oh, it should have been underneath. So, would card is it still worthwhile to put cardboard on top of your topsoil? Only if you have noxious weeds that are going to grow up through it. Cardboard right. is a barrier to stop a noxious weed. Okay. Have yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So. so just Tell them we have no idea. Yeah, so we have no idea, Mel. You can hear what Mel needs. Well, yeah. I, I know your project, you know. I just, yeah. just water that strip of land this year. Put too much water on it so all the weeds will grow. Get out there yeah. with your lawnmower. Mow it down the first year. Plant your food yeah. crops in it the second year. And and if you have patches of quack grass and morning glory coming up, that's the yeah. place where you need the cardboard. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, I'll take one more question tonight from whoever asks it first. Wait, I need to look at the chat. Somebody probably asked questions here. <coughs> if you ask a question in the chat, unmute real quick and ask it. I, I don't know. I'm not good at this stuff. Uh, it it's like just me vetting you out about putting soil on the table. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> he has <laughs> have i ever done that Vernie? okay it might not have been soil but it was large rocks that you thought were cool and you had a big old uh discussion about the kind of the kind of soil and nutrients they would make if they were you know in your garden <laughs> it was great we have all kinds of things that end up on the table yeah, she used to have a kitchen and then it all became really good uh well two things it becomes a good greenhouse at certain times of the year and then at other times of the year all the utensils go out into the garden <laughs> okay we it's better true. we better quit this i'm gonna get in trouble okay good night we will be back next week um write down your questions as you think of them over the week Invite your friends and family to this. It is free. Um, if you want to come to boot camp, uh, we do have room. And we're probably going to organize a family boot camp. I think Helena had an idea for that months ago. I'm probably going to do that in the summer, but I just haven't figured it out with my schedule because we have weird things happening this summer, and so I haven't been able to schedule it. But th wouldn't that be cool to have like five families and 20 kids running around mixing up potting soil? That would scare me to death. But I think we might try it. It could be fun. Uh, so if you know anybody who wants to do that or participate, let me know. Okay, I'm going to um, end this for tonight. We will see you next week. And good night, everybody. Thanks for being on. Thanks.